here we go here. All right. I will be speaking with an English accent the entire time. And I will be speaking with a Cogney accent the entire time. Okay. And here we go. Away we go. All right. Hi guys, uh, this is Adrian here, Datu of the Geeks, and you're on Nerd Rage. With me here are the very awesome people from Bat in the Sun, Kevin Porter and Joe Barra. Welcome to the Philippines, welcome to Manila. Thank you, so good to be here. It's great to be here, thank you so much for having us. <laughs> we love it here, the people are amazing. <laughs> See that on purpose. <laughs> This is your last night here in Manila. Oh, and and you guys were here for BatCon. We were here for BatCon yeah. uh, with the gracious people of the Dark Knight Philippines, and um, I've done a lot of conventions. I attend 15 a year, which is amazing when my schedule permits. Without a doubt, this was the most well-run, well-organized uh, convention that I've ever been to. I can't thank the um, the event planners um, and uh, Selena Kyle. Uh, for uh, for making this all happen because she was incredible people know you as or you've been very much known for being internet Batman the force will sustain me long enough exactly better focused on you than me you underestimated me I underestimate nothing which as, fa as far as fans are concerned, is a good thing because fans have been very supportive of your portrayals uh -huh. of Bruce Wayne and Batman and even The Punisher online and, and your other roles. So um, how do you look at your, your, your career in that sense? It's such a great question. Initially, when I started doing work with Bat in the Sun, mm -hmm. I did it for the passion. I did not view it as any type of career move whatsoever. So we did uh, Batman Legends, we did uh, City of Scars, we did Seeds of Arkham, but they were never on my IMDb, they were never on my uh, reel, they weren't on my resume, my agent didn't know about them. Um, it was just something that I did because I loved it, but I, not in a million years did I think that it would be a career booster at all. And then suddenly this amazing thing happened around 2012, 2013, and this explosion, and I'm sure it goes in conjunction with um, with the Big Bang Theory, and this uh, interesting thing called cosplay that just came about. I, I didn't know what cosplay was. I didn't know what the word was. I thought it was hero clicks. I I literally thought it was a game, mm -hmm. and people started associating my name with cosplay, um, which which I, I don't. I, I I've, the only time I really ever dress up is when uh, Warner Brothers will uh, will send me out, or whenever I do with Bat in the Sun. Um, production but and also the comments social media started picking up Facebook started picking up and the comments on YouTube were just very very favorable and my name kept showing up over and over again and people started knowing my name which that blew me away and then I started getting recognized on the street like oh Kevin Porter I'm like and I've done some some high-profile things such as uh, General Hospital Daredevil Dodgeball according to Jim Hughley's um, but to be recognized for something that I really didn't put a lot of stock into. I've used, viewed it more as a hobby than anything else. But then my agent said, Kevin, I, I Googled you and your name is, is popped up a lot. And it seems as if you have a really big fan base out there with this whole Batman thing. I think we should consolidate the fan base, get them under one roof with, um, with a Facebook page. And at this point I had zero social media presence. This is 2013. And I'm like, sure, okay. And then once that happened, then all the fans started coming over to this one umbrella, so to speak. And I realized that I can use this and springboard this into other opportunities. And it, it kept building and building because it took a while to realize that, that social media and YouTube and the internet is as viable as going to um, the box office or watching on television. There are more people that watch um, YouTube videos 10,000 times more than watch anything on television right. and to be a part of that has been a huge boost to my career so now not only do I embrace it I anchor my career based off of the um, the internet and the um, the viral videos that, that I'm in and those were very awesome viral videos like Batman vs. Darth Vader was really nuts 40 million was views insane. 40 yeah. million views 
And um, because it's great. I watch it now. Joe and I were watching it earlier today. Mm -hmm. And we're just, we're blown away at the quality. We're blown away at the vision that Aaron Shonky had, the execution that, uh, that uh, Sean Shonky had. And um, the costumes, the music, the sets, the performances. I, I'm proud of. I'm proud of the work. And when you do something that is good, because, it, yeah, it's niche. All you have to do is say Batman Vader, and that's going to get attention. But if it's not great, if it doesn't last, it'll die out quickly. Um, but when you do something of quality, it will last forever. And this is something that lasts forever. When I go through um, airports, Batman Vader. Hey, Batman. And I know if I say, oh, uh, what's your favorite beatdown? They'll say Batman Vader. 95% um, of the people when I ask what their favorite beatdown is, they'll say Batman Vader. And now you have Batman versus, uh, Flashpoint Batman versus Killmonger. Flashpoint Batman versus Killmonger. My suit's made of vibranium. It's in a struggle. Get it? Let's see how well it does against Amazonian steel. Let's go! Um, I gotta say it was an interesting process to see Kevin transform from Kevin Porter to Batman. Because this was the first Bat in the Sun project that I've worked on where Kevin had to don the cowl. So, I went from seeing him being vegan to being bison to being Batman. And it was the most intense I've seen him becoming Batman. Because as soon as he was suited up, when the cowl was on, I couldn't talk to I couldn't call him Kevin. Because he wasn't Kevin Porter at that moment. He was indeed Thomas Wayne. It's a beautiful character. It's a character that if you're, um, if you're lazy or you misunderstand the character, you won't get what the character is about. And the character, as I mentioned before, it's a sad character. And um, it's a character, yes, that may have this veil of rage, may have this wall of fury, but that's hiding pain and it's hiding sadness. And, and it's hiding the loss of his son. So when Thomas Wayne isn't out there killing the scourge of Gotham, He's home. He's crying. He's in the corner. He's he's missing his family. Not he didn't just lose his child. He lost his wife. He lost his future. He lost his hope. He has no hope. There's nothing to live for. So he gives everyone something to die for, and that's all hinging on one moment, one bullet, one one decision that he wishes that he could have taken back. And that once you have that down, that character is so beautiful. I think it's a a, a more intricate, beautiful character than Bruce is. And once I got into that mindset, I would have no problem revisiting. It's hard getting there, mm -hmm. but I would love to explore that even more. So if, if Thomas Wayne is the hopeless character, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you approach Bruce Wayne, okay. both with the mask and without? It's, it's an interesting topic and it's, and it's hard to talk about. But at an early age, we're conditioned to lose our parents. We're going to lose them. And that's sad to say. And, and I, I've lost mine and it has, it has changed me but it's a natural part of the, uh, of the process. With Bruce, it just happened early and it happened before his eyes. Mm -hmm. And that changes him, but that is a little more natural than it is watching your child gun down in front of you. And so at an early age, it, it forged him into something stronger. I think that, um, that uh, Thomas is driven out of pain and weakness. And I think that Bruce is driven out of strength and anger and he wants, he's looking for vengeance. He's looking to right the wrong every night that he suits up. He's looking to go out there and he's searching metaphorically for his parents' killers. He's a, he's a little child because as soon as he saw his parents shot, that child was frozen in time. And so whenever I see Bruce Wayne, definitely when I see Batman, I see a child grown up going out there trying to, to kill or bring in save his parents. I think that's 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 an interesting take on, on that as well. Um, both characters aren't just, hey, I'm going to put the suit on, I'm going to be badass, I'm going to go beat up people. Not at all. You, you have to find out what makes these people tick. And once you lift the hood up and you go in there and you figure it out, then you can, everything else takes care of itself. I love that you really know your characters inside and out. Mm -hmm. So, and, and as a director myself, I, I love that I love it when actors do their, their research and uh, 
basically exercise due diligence mm-hmm. in, in knowing their characters. So, um, are you a method actor or are you a an Eric Morris actor of being? Mm-hmm. That's something I talk a lot about in class, and Joe can attest to that. Oh yeah, so again, we're, we'll, let's go back to Batman Killmonger. Mm-hmm. When I would get uh, Kevin suited up, if we were 30 minutes or an hour from the take, I'd still see Kevin Porter. But when we were about 20 minutes out, mm-hmm. I'd notice, I'd be like, oh, where's Kevin? I would see him alone, and I wouldn't dare, I felt this energy, and I wouldn't dare enter that space, because I'm, I'm like, that's he's doing whatever he needs to to get into the character. Because I imagine that Thomas Wayne's difficult to just snap into. I'm not. I'm not method. I'm more Meisner. Meisner. And so, um, what I am is the best version of me that I could be. So whenever I get into the mind space, it's Kevin as if, and I go to loss. And I have been fortunate to have come out of the other end of loss and be a better person for it. Because I don't think that you know how good and how powerful and how strong you are until you experience loss and how you cope with that loss. And I had, I had a spell that tested me and every single time I'm like, I got this, I got this. And so that, and I talk about this all the time in class, is that you mine that anger, you mine that pain, you mine that confusion on, on why and you bring it out and you make sense of the loss. So I'm over there, as you said, for 30 minutes thinking about love and thinking about loss and I'm not assigning a name to it I'm not assigning a face to it I'm just pulling up the um, the energy and the passion and the feelings and then bringing that into the um, performance so for those who are not familiar with the differences between method and the Meissner method uh, sorry the Meissner uh, mode of acting and the method acting can, can you tell our viewers yeah if what you the um, with are? method is um, you you truly put on the skin of the character and let's say that, um, and I would say I am Batman, and you you refer to me as Batman, my mindset is Batman, I'm going to eat Captain Crunch as Batman, I'm going to eat my pancakes as Batman, I am Batman. And every decision that I make during the process of the filming is Batman. Every decision I make um, is, is Batman. And to me, you have very few people that can do that, that well. And the people that can do it well um, are these you know, crazy geniuses like Daniel D. Lewis. They're just geniuses. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is one. I think um, Leonardo and Johnny Depp are the ones that can kind of toe the line a little bit. Their method, uh, Marlon Brando's method, early on, not so much later, um, but it does mess with you a little bit because you're blurring the lines. With Meisner, you're being the best person that you could be and you're do- doing the big as if. So with me, I'm me the entire time. Whenever I watch myself as Batman, as um, as Bison, as Armstrong, that's Kevin up there. But that's Kevin as if he were, with, um, in the um, the case of Armstrong, that's Kevin as if he were an immortal 10,000 years old with godlike abilities. At no point do I think that I am Armstrong. So every decision that I make and every interaction that I have with my scene partner comes across with authenticity. I, um, but to do that, you have to do the work that you said. You have to do the background of the character, how the character would react. You ingest that. Basically, it's all data entry. Data entry, and then you you bring it together with Kevin, your psyche, and then have it come out. To me, all I want is, is truth in that moment. I don't want to pretend like I'm anyone. I'm not going to pretend like I'm Batman. I'm, I am Batman. I'm Kevin's Batman. And that is different than anyone else's Batman. And there's truth in that. Because if you say, well, Kevin no longer exists, that's not true. That's not real. It's not authentic. But if you and I have a conversation, and it'll be so genuine, similar to you and I having a conversation right now. I say it all the time. If someone, had, if someone were shooting us for a film, we'd win Oscars. Because we're just being us. And that's the most compelling thing in the world, is true conversation. And that's what we have. As, as long as we don't lose what authentically makes us us and that's the Meisner technique very interesting because um, I read somewhere uh, a comic what was this oh Superman Birthright mm-hmm. uh, Mark Wade wrote 
uh, Clark Kent in such a way that he was trying to find his voice as the Clark Kent in Metropolis mm -hmm. person, and uh, Jonathan Kent gave him a book on the Meisner method. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Wow. Do some research on that. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So apparently, Clark Kent uses the Meisner. Clark Kent does Meisner. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So Joe, um, how is it like working in Pat and the Sun? Because you were a former student. I was. Of, of I, I still am a student. You still are. But. Okay. It's a surreal experience because okay. all the uh, all the films I've done up to that point were short films. Right. And when I was on a bat in the sunset, I saw what it had, what I I needed to do to get to the next level. Because the bat in the sun production, my first project was Joker vs. Negan, mm -hmm. and it was Negan. intense. It was 18-hour days watching Kevin and Aaron duke it out as Negan and Joker. And I saw them putting their heart and soul into this product. And I realized while I was on a bat in the sunset, good isn't great. You have to strive for greatness. That's the message I've come across on every bat in the sun production. So uh, did you have any preconceived notions prior to working in bat in the sun? And, uh, and did, did any of those uh, notions change after that? Honestly, when the opportunity came up, I was just excited to be on set with these guys because I started off as fans like all you guys so for me to give them given that opportunity I was just honored and all I I just went in there knowing I don't care how they are I just want to show them the best version of me and show them that no matter what their needs are I can meet them and I can go the distance all right uh, one thing I love about you guys is that both of you are fans mm -hmm. at the very core and I guess that goes for everyone in Bat on the Side yeah uh, I met Jenny before because we brought her here for a convention that I organized. Jenny? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Jenny Wainer? Yeah. Our Jenny? Yeah. Oh, wow. Why, why are you just selling with us now? So, uh, one thing I also realized about the, the Van Deans was that they're also fans. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. and, they are. And I guess it goes for everyone in Pat in the Sun. And I, and I love that because, um, you know, uh, we're currently in that time where you, you have the the greats, the, the, the veteran directors, mm -hmm. the Scorseses and the Coppolas talking about how superhero movies are not cinema. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you guys think of that? Here we go. It's a completely 100% accurate statement. And mm -hmm. I know Kevin loves to elaborate more on this. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, my belief um, is uh, we started with, let's say we started with uh, with Dick Donner, Superman, all about story, beautiful story. Um, then it went to um, there was a long hiatus, and it went to '89 Batman. Then a bit of a hiatus, and then we came X Men, Iron Man, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, and it got to the point where then Disney took over. They're great movies, okay? Yeah, they're great movies. They're fun movies. They're live action cartoons. And that was the hardest thing for me to figure out because I'm like, why am I not loving this? It's because I expect more out of cinema. I expect more out of my $16. I go there and I invest two hours of my life and I want to see what they've been doing for the last two years of this film. I want to see story. I want to care about these people. I want to go on the journey with these people, with this person. So why wasn't I enjoying this? And we, um, I think we, it hit a tipping point when we went to see Spider-Man's Far From Home. Mm -hmm. We saw it in Grauman's Chinese Theater. Mm -hmm. And if you see anything there, you're giving it the greatest, the greatest chance of success because you're seeing it in the greatest theater ever. It's beautiful. Right, right. So we saw it there and I'm watching it and I'm just getting angry as we go, angry, because they are, they're basically slapping lipstick on a pig and telling us it's beautiful. It's bloated, it's big, it's colorful, it's CGI, so they're not even human beings that we're watching. And the stories were paper thin and they're reinventing canon and they're, it's basically turned into a cookie cutter mm -hmm. um, system by Disney. And it's for many reasons. Um, and so I was angry when we left. And I said, I think that we finally, hopefully, hit a tipping point to where people are gonna say, enough is enough. We expect more. We're gonna demand more from the comic book movies. Cause like the real estate market, it'll get to the point where the bubble bursts and then they're gone. And hopefully we'll, we'll auto correct it before that happens. And then I see everyone come, coming out of the theater and they're just happy. They're like, that was the greatest movie I've ever seen. 
and it's like this mass hypnosis that everyone's lining up buying it is Pavlonian and everyone's waiting at the end of the credits everyone's waiting because we have been trained to wait for the post credit sequence they're literally reinventing um, reinventing the game and so I think that bigger is not better I think that it's a big explosion of um, of confetti and glitter very little story um, and for us to have to see 22 movies to get one story is ridiculous it's manipulative it's genius and it it basically ensures that we're gonna have to see this movie to see how this movie ended because it leads to that movie to see to go over to this movie and that's fine because that's all we do is line up to see movies but I don't want to be forced to see the movie because I feel like I'm missing out that's another thing that they're doing um, whereas when you have Joker which is a standalone it's not gonna lead to anything else it came from nothing else it's a beautiful standalone film that had a beginning a middle and an end and it was all about story and it let us understand how a character a beautiful character such, such as the Joker comes to be and in the United States it's caught a lot of crap because they're saying it sympathizes with a serial killer okay well first of all uh, the, the serial killer was in Batman um, or in Do the Dark Knight okay he was also in um, 89 Batman and he killed thousands of people in 89 Batman in Dark Knight he killed you know hundreds of people in the Dark Knight but that was okay he looked a lot he looked a lot like Joaquin Phoenix killed 20 times more people than Joaquin Phoenix but it was okay because we didn't really see how he was created we didn't take responsibility as a culture as a society we did not take responsibility because he's a cartoony villain he did nothing cartoony he was pretty brutal killed with guns and pencils but it was still killing people but it was okay let's give him an Oscar okay but now people are picketing Joker because they're saying um, we're sympathizing with them with a killer no no we're exploring what happens when society lets us down what happens when we bully what happens when a victim turns it around and we don't want to see that because then suddenly we have responsibility for our actions right so we don't want to see how the monsters made it's like we want we want our hot dogs but we don't want to know what's in it and the Joker is showing us what's in that hot dog that we've been eating for the last 50 years it's a beautiful character study um, and when you see it you don't sympathize with it you just say you know what we need to do more as a culture and as a society to not let characters like that because we step over those people on the street we walk by them in a 7-eleven we don't we don't give them anything we uh, we see them doing you know talking to themselves on a subway we just turn away what can we do we could do more we can do more so rather than point our finger and say they're they're monsters let's try to understand a little bit about how they're created and that for you is cinema cinema is being more than what is inside the theater yeah, more you, than the spectacle yeah you look at um you look at taxi driver you look at dog day afternoon you look at these great characters of the early 70s mid 70s and that to me it, you know chinatown and french connection and that's when cinema was and and that's your background as well to me that's when truism realism really took hold and we've lost that there's nothing true or real or authentic about endgame at all it's nice and you know you know iron man died and he died because he was written to die he died because they he went back in time going through some microverse i don't even know you, you lost me because you can't connect the dots um but when you know when you're um, going to see the champ and you see john voigt dying and you see ricky schroeder who is his son he's pouring his heart out that moves me and that makes me think um all that end game made me think is um is what's for dinner i, I didn't think about anything I, it was like going on a roller coaster ride going that was fun but when you when when you leave joker and if you go with the friends you sit there afterwards and you talk about it and it brings up conversation of things that maybe aren't that fun to talk about and that's thought provoking that's moving and that's making a difference that's cinema this is a very interesting conversation um, you guys work in fandom 
and for all intents and purposes, it's it uh, they they are images of spectacle. I work on projects with visual effects, which are also images mm-hmm. of spectacle. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it personally, I've been trying to find a way to reconcile that. So, uh, for you guys uh, as actors uh, and as film practitioners, mm-hmm. how do you reconcile working in the spectacle of comics, or, or reconcile that with the core of what cinema really is? A lot of my friends do mocap. Um, and I'm going to go on record and say I'm not a fan of it. Anything that, that you could do that replaces a human being, I'm not a fan of. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, you take that movement and you put it on the screen. However, uh, they did a, a digital scan of me, a 3D scan for Salvage Marines. I didn't want to do it. I don't want anything up there on screen that I'm not doing. Okay, I do appreciate the spectacle because Spider-Man, you know, shouldn't be able to do what he's doing. Right. But, damn. We're actors, we're human beings, and it's our job as filmmakers to make a man climb that building. Not a cartoon, a man climb the building. It's like um, with Superman, you'll believe a man could fly because we saw Christopher Reeve fly. And you're right, and I like the word spectacle because when we go and we watch Endgame and Black Panther and, um, and Far From Home, it is an event, it is a spectacle, it is a big, giant strawberry 7-eleven slurpee that we're just drinking it and it tastes great drink it too fast you get um you get a brain freeze um but we're to the point where grown-ups are going to see these movies and not and not wanting to admit that they're caught cartoons because they're grown they're grown-ups and we're watching live action no you're watching cartoons you're grown up going to watch cartoons the same way they're watching scooby-doo that's how I view them. That's how I, how I have to view them to see them. Because if I go in thinking that I'm going to be inspired, no. Am I going to be moved? No. Am I going to have it, you know, shoot off some synapse of me that makes me think about something? Not at all. If I remove, if I lobotomize myself and get rid of that and I go to see the colors, and I'm a huge comic book fan, and I have been from the moment I was born, it was shoved down my throat and so I am I am as big of a self-proclaimed nerd as you can get I know everything and so I appreciate seeing them up there but there's a certain point to where I expect more I like Doctor Strange I liked Doctor Strange Doctor Strange was a good one Ragnarok was a good one because when you really look at it they're relatively small stories right. I like the standalones maybe it's more of more of the the Avengers movies, and when they start shoving way too many villains in there, but um, how do I how do I walk that line between spectacle and cinema? I think the moment that you bring in a character like um, I had a hard time with the Hulk being CGI. I, I wouldn't even know how you would do that. But um, I, I definitely did not like um, uh, King Kong Skull Island. Because again, you're watching cartoons. You're watching a character that doesn't exist fighting another character that doesn't exist. And to me, the most impo- the most exciting parts of Jurassic Park are the human parts on how they're reacting to the cartoons. Because they're not real, they're not up there. Um, this whole process basically almost made Liam Neeson retire from acting. Because when he did Phantom Menace? Phantom Menace. Yes, it was Phantom Menace. When he did Phantom yeah. Menace, He's on a green screen acting um, acting opposite of a tennis ball. He said, if this is the future of cinema, then I want nothing of it. And, and it kind of was the future of cinema. But you look over and he hasn't really done uh, larger movies like that because it's taking the moment out of it. And when we say living truthfully with an imaginary circumstance, an imaginary circumstance should be the script, the text, the relationship, not the world. The most beautiful thing about being on set a, a practical locations you look around and you're immersed in that world when I shot Batman Vader we're truly on a spaceship well, it's a spaceship but it was a great set wow it was, it was an actual set absolutely wow. it's stunning when we were shooting uh, Batman Killmonger we were down in the basement of um, of uh, a high rise but it looked just like a subway mm-hmm. if we're all green screen I just shot a lot of green screen work with salvage Marines and they're saying, okay, Kevin, shoot up to the left, and you're shooting this big 30-foot 30, 30 bone worm. I don't even know what a bone worm is. I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm just shooting, and I'm just like shooting a big laser cannon. Right. And 
they're like, okay, Kevin, we want you to walk up to the bottom of this pyramid and then you look up. And I'm just looking at green screen. And I'm like, what am I looking at? I want to see what I'm looking at so at least I can, I can give the as if that's what I'm looking at. It's not, it wasn't my favorite work, but the dynamic between the two people within a practical set, then you can immerse yourself so much more. Well, as a, as a filmmaker involved with visual effects, there always is that temptation for mm -hmm. me to treat my actors as little action figures mm -hmm. in a place set that mm -hmm. I could just place wherever. Mm -hmm. And, oh, it's green. I can place them wherever I want. Oh, I can change the world whenever I feel like it. Yeah. Uh, and that makes me sometimes forget that actors are actually people mm -hmm. and that they have real emotions. And, and I'm tinkering with actual emotions. So, uh, what advice can you give directors of my ilk? I'd say respect your actors, respect their process, and remember that they're not just going to be these puppets that are going to say the words and do whatever you say. They're going to be in the moment. They're going to react. Sometimes they may go off script and you need to anticipate that and be open to the possibility of the unknown. Right. It's a collaboration and, and actors are artists the way that the writers and artists, the way that the directors and artists. And a true collaboration is three, three things come together and you create the miracle of life. Mm -hmm. And life is fragile and life is unique. And life changes from second to second, definitely take to take. And if, if Joe and I are having a real moment and he does something that triggers something, that triggers something in my past and it sends me off in a different direction and it creates a beautiful moment, a real moment, then that is so beautiful because that's the miracle of life that you've captured, you have it on film, you've got the audio of it. And um, if it's, it may not be word for word or whatever it may be, maybe at the end of a take. If um, the best directors to me are the ones that don't say cut at the end of a take. And they go, let's see what happens. Let's see where they go. Let's see how truly into that moment that they are. And to me, the worst actors in the world, if they run out of dialogue and, and the camera's still running, that they'll look at the director and they'll go, I, I get, I, I'm livid because what that means is you're not truly living in that moment. And you're, at, when you run out of dialogue, you're no longer shackled by the text and by the words. And you can truly take off and, and go in whatever direction that your heart takes you with someone that you're, you're loving mm -hmm. in that moment. And so what my advice to you would be is, res like he said, respect the process. Actors are artists and they know the heartbeat of that character. They may not have written the character, but they know the heartbeat of it. And they're gonna give their interpretation, their spin. They're not meat puppets, you know, just to basically speak your words. They are, they have their own interpretation and their own interpretation is just as, as genuine as the person that wrote the words. Because they're gonna bring something to it that you're gonna say as a writer, damn, I didn't even, wow, I didn't even think about that. Because they're living it. They're hurting, they, they feel that pain, that pain that you wrote, they feel it, it's breaking their heart. They feel that joy. And what a blessing that is to have that manifest through a, another human being that loves your work so much that they're willing to invest their true heart and their true emotion in it. Well, what I'm gathering from this is that um, you guys are really passionate about what you're doing and even, even with 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 in regards to whether you're Batman or you're throwing a ball or or or, or whatever, you guys put passion into each and every role that you put in, and that's very admirable because I've I've seen actors phone it in, but you guys are real pros, and I I, I, I as a fan of the characters that you represent, I appreciate it. I really appreciate it very much. So. Um, do you have any final messages for uh, for our people here in the Philippines? Well, I want to, um, this gentleman sitting to my left, you're right. I've known for three years now. Yeah. And to me, he's an example of a success story. And people ask me, how, how do you get into the, in, in the industry? Mm -hmm. How do you get into the business? And the first thing I say is be selfless, remove ego. Um, don't accept mediocrity remove qualifiers from your um, vocabulary, such as maybe, kinda, sorta, I'll do my best, things like that. Two words, yes or no. Yes or no. Commit to it. And um, all we wanna hear is a yes or no. If you can't, if you say no, no problem at all, thank you for your honesty, move on. Um, he had an opportunity and he seized it. 
And what he did by that is he stepped up and he proved himself. Um, and I would love to get your, your perspective on, on how, go back in time and talk to your former self from three years ago. Um, I would just say, and honestly the way I'm living right now, always be open to the possibility of the unknown. Every day is different. Always give 100% of yourself to everyone because you never know who you're talking to. And when an opportunity comes up, take it and seize it. Because if I didn't do that, I would not be here right now. I wouldn't be this man's friend. I wouldn't have been on a bat in the sunset. Every time you get a chance to take an opportunity, that's a chance for you to prove yourself. And you are ready. You just gotta fully trust and believe in yourself. And give no less than 100% effort if this is your true calling. Well, I noticed that you're really buff and all that. Will we see you in a future Bat in the Sun production oh, as a certain character? Without though? a doubt. Yeah. Without um, a doubt. This was just uh, decided that he will be in the upcoming um, uh, Black Widow, Black Canary, Canary video coming up. Yeah. He will be in that. The next one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. It's such an honor, such a pleasure. The honor is mine. I want to. Um, I want to thank you. I want to give a best, uh, special thank you to uh, Francis. Uh, Francis, lower that microphone so the camera can see it. <laughs> lower, lower. I want to see the camera. Put it in frame. Put it in frame. In right. Yes, yeah. he's been holding that microphone. He's been holding this whole that time. microphone the entire time, pointing it at, at us. Yes. Which to me, that's doing the, exactly what you need to do. Mm -hmm. When I see you, Francis, I see Joe. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, you're paying your dues. You're kicking ass. Exactly. And you're learning, because. Um, not a lot of people would stand there and hold that. They would say, can we find something, please? They would have found something to rest it on. Yeah, so Francis, keep doing what you're doing, listening, mm -hmm. listen to this man, and you will, uh, you will exceed. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. All right, uh, mga ka Yuck. Yuck. All right, there okay, you have it, on, guys. Are, are, are you going to really erase that? Sorry, what? Are you going to erase that? Are you going to cut and... If you're going to... Yeah. No, I'm going to cut and... It's going to be part of the thing. Oh, oh, oh so yeah. it's just a part of the thing, too? Yeah. This is a part of it? Alrighty, I love it. Oh, well... Live, this is live. We can do anything. <laughs> We're not going to cut. Right. Well, Evening, governor. All right. Ch ch cheerio. Good boy. Tell you how. Thank you. Thank you. Good boy. Going back to the access. Are we still running? Are we still going? Are we done? Are we done? Are we done?